Today on Executive Report, we're meeting with John Harbaugh, the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. He'll be discussing the importance of faith and leadership in continuing a winning tradition. So hit that like button and subscribe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Executive Report. Uh, today, we're blessed to sit with John Harbaugh, head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. So I know many of you know who he is, but before I get started with the questions, let's uh, read a little bit of his profile. So Coach John Harbaugh is in his 15th season as the Ravens head coach. The 2019 NFL Coach of the Year has led Baltimore to the playoffs in nine of his 14 seasons and in 2012 won the franchise's second world championship. Though it's impossible to th ignore the success under his tenure, John never wants it to be about him or any single individual. Quote, it's all about us. It's about the team. It's about the players, the coaches, Steve, Ozzy, Eric, and the scouts. It's about Dick, Sashi, and the support staff. It's about all of us pulling together to win, to be the best. We don't want to just win a championship. We want to be a championship team. So Coach Harbaugh, welcome to Executive Reports. Great being with you. It's an honor. It's an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So I have to say, um, this is my first time at the castle, and it lives up to the expectations. Uh, everything here is absolutely pristine, and it really represents the culture of the Ravens in general about being the best and really creating that winning culture. So I'm curious, I mean, what, what have you guys done over the last 15 years to really solidify and create that culture of, of winning? Well, as far as the building, I got to give Renee Bichotti credit. For <laughs> what I've been told, you know, and I, was, I wasn't here when they first did the building, but Renee was pretty much the driving force behind the, the beauty of the building. They wanted it to be different, not like a normal NFL football building. Yeah. So uh, this is what you see, and it kind of created something. I do think it kind of lends uh, to the uh, kind of uh, the, the idea that we want to do things the right way in a first-class way. Uh, the culture question, that's a big question. You know, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, fundamentally, I think it starts with what you talked about. It starts with, it starts with us being about the team, mm. you know, and to want, want to be the very best team we can be. We want to be the best team in the National Football League, and we want to prove it. You know, that's kind of how we look at it from a football standpoint. But all the things that go with that, you know, that are under that umbrella – uh, and that kind of are the core of those things are all the type of values that lead to that kind of success. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's honesty and there's, there's toughness, of course, and there's hard work and there's uh, respect and those things that we talk about all the time and then try to, mm -hmm. try to make an example of. Absolutely. So uh, I should tell the viewing audience, you know, first and foremost, in full transparency, I'm a Ravens fan through and through uh, from day one, born and raised in Baltimore. And I remember um, when, when they came to the city, I remember the Brian Billick years. And I remember when you were taking over as head coach. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, um, I, I thought to myself, uh, this is a new head coach. And he's walking into this locker room of these huge personalities, guys like Ray Lewis and Terrell Suggs and Ed Reed. And I thought, how does a new head coach handle that? Did you have to alter your leadership style or, or was it intimidating at all? Uh, not intimidating. I mean, it was, it was a challenge. I remember Rex Ryan, who's, who's a good friend of mine and mm -hmm. was at the time, he told me at the time, he said, he said, Harbs, this will be the, the best job of the jobs that are open and it'll also be the toughest job. <laughs> and it was it was a divided team, and there was a lot of issues going on. And that's probably why the changes made. I mean, Brian Billick's a great coach, great guy, had done an amazing job, and for whatever reason, it was just time to kind of go in a direction that uh, that Steve felt need, it needed to go in terms of kind of to unify the team. And that was my job to unify the team. I think I was hired because the leadership style, if you want to call it that, personality, the things that we were talking about through the inter interview process, that I was going to basically make important were the things that Steve felt were needed to unify the team. It wasn't easy. There were a lot of challenges, but uh, it was a good fit in that sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I was, I was probably the right guy at the right time. Uh, thanks to Steve, I think very few owners or very few owners would have recognized that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was kind of a guy who kind of came out of nowhere, more of a special teams background in the, in, in co in the National Football League, more of a defensive guy, I guess, a uh, young guy. But uh, determined, and uh, Stephen, I understood where Steve was coming from with what he was looking for, and Ozzy, and Eric, and those guys, and uh, we just kind of stuck to our guns and never backed down, and it's worked out. It has worked out really well. And to your point, uh, the right guy at the right time. I think the Ravens have done a great job of that. They always seem to have the right people for the right moments, whatever those moments are, mm -hmm. um, whether it be players, coaches, personnel, whatever the case is. And now, um, you know, the team is very young compared to what it was back then. 
I mean, you, you had guys who were already clear-cut Hall of Famers, um, first ballots, and now uh, you've got these guys that are working towards that. Is it a completely different dynamic? Uh, it is a completely different dynamic in that sense. We've been through, going as you said, 15th year now. There's been a lot of iterations of different <laughs> dynamics. You know, even back then when Ray was here, each year was a little bit different. Even the championship year, Ray really wasn't around for eight or nine weeks with the injury. So it's not just year to year, it's week to week. Mm -hmm. So, but this team is different. Every team's a little bit different. Uh, this team is exciting. We've got different things that we need to uh, build around in terms of personalities and, and challenges and, and, and things that might motivate us, but you just find those things as you go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, whatever we're doing, it's working. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I've heard you mention on numerous occasions that uh, part of your routine is relying on faith and prayer. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, how have you seen those things um, come to fruition on the field and in the locker room? Well, I mean, that's that's a good question because I don't really always know exactly what God's thinking, you know, and uh, is that, I don't know how unusual that is. Maybe other people do, but uh, it's, uh, to me, it's just, it's part of who, who I am personally. I think everybody kind of walks their own journey that way and makes their own choices and, and decisions. And for me, it started in college and it's just kind of grown. I've been, I've been a slow growth. I've been a hard learner a lot of times, a little bit hard headed, but over time, you know, God whips us into shape. I have found, at least in my case, uh, a lot of times through some tough challenges and, uh, I've just begun to rely and start to understand there are certain things that you can't control, even though you want to, as a coach especially, you want to control everything all the mm -hmm. time, every variable. And uh, God makes it pretty clear to me that that's not something that he's going to really, he's not really up for, you know? Yeah. He's in control of these things. And uh, it's made me more patient, a little more understanding, and, uh, and I think a better coach in the end. Something that, that I've learned over the years is that um, regardless of what is happening at the moment, you know, God can use those things for a good at some level. Mm -hmm. So even if you think it's a bad thing now, uh, it can be turned around for something good. And having a faith to believe in that for me has been a game changer in my career. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well, where maybe there's an injury or something happens. And, you know, a month later you say, oh, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Yeah. But, no question. I mean, you know, Romans 8, 28 says, God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, and that's that's a big one. Yes. That's a big one. And uh, so when those things happen, even, even, even I go back to the Bengals when, we, when we, they completed the fourth and 12 for the touchdown and knocked us out of the playoffs, you know, I, I felt like I was cut in half with machine gun fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it felt emotionally. And uh, yet out of that, we, we grew a whole new defensive structure mm -hmm. that was grown and born out of that that we, we used for the next four years. And now again, we're kind of redoing that again. And you grow every year and do something different every year. But, you know, it's, it, 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 these, these things that are challenges and that, that you learn from and you grow from, hey, you either win or you, or you learn. I, I think hopefully you win and you learn, but sometimes <laughs> you lose and you learn. Yeah. And uh, it forces you sometimes to look at things in a hard way and, and, and improve. Yeah. So have, have uh, <clears throat> the players in the locker room taken on that same kind of perspective? Well, I mean, you know, everybody's in their own place. You know, that's one thing about leadership. You've got to meet everybody where they're at. You know, no two people are exactly the same. We've got guys who are 20 years old and guys who are 34 years old, 35 years old. Mm -hmm. Some guys have three, four, five, six kids who are playing. You've got, you got coaches, we've got scouts, we've got people in marketing, people in the building. So uh, I think people are in different places, but the principles are what they are, and they're, they're clearly stated. Everybody kind of understands what we stand for. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think we try to respect everybody's opinions on different things and try to be, uh, try to be uh, 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 an outgrowth of everything that everybody stands for and kind of include everybody into what be, in, ends up being our culture and who we are is a, is a part of everybody that's part of it. Yeah. For me, uh, faith was something that I was raised with. I can't, I can't remember a time where we weren't praying, we weren't going to church, you know, anything of that mm. nature. It always seemed to happen. Uh, is that something that started for you as a young age or something you learned later on? Yeah, you know, we, were, we grew up a Catholic family, you know, and uh, and we were in Catholic schools, so that was part of it. But it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was the focal point of our house or anything like that. You know, my, my dad was a coach. My mom was a coach's wife and a very smart, very smart, highly educated person. And uh, they were they were people of faith, but they wasn't something that we talked about much, you know. Um, I, that kind of happened more as an adult kind yeah. of grew into as an adult more. Was there like a moment in time where? Yeah. Well, my freshman year in college, I, I was invited to a Bible study and I, I went to it with some of the other guys in the team and, and uh, they, they kind of introduced me to the gospel in a way I really hadn't heard it before. The idea that Jesus uh, was God, you know, mm -hmm. incarnate and, and then the saving grace of the cross, you know, I'd never really understood that before. And it kind of made sense to me in a big grand picture. It gave me hope that I didn't really see anywhere else. And, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that, you know? And then, then the changes begin, you know, then, then the work <laughs> begins, you know, and, 
over the course of the next, what, 35, 40 years, you know, that's that, that uh, you, you come to where I am now as a slow learner that I am. <laughs> <laughs> so has, has that affected how, how your family runs today with your kids and, and your wife? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, my wife and daughter are very, uh, you know, faith-oriented people. My daughter amazes me all the time. Matter of fact, she takes me, she's taking me to my first uh, Christian concert here. All right. In a few days, so looking forward to that. That should be fun. <laughs> so one thing I do know um, is that most of the successful head coaches out there, or the winning head coaches, have some sort of belief system. Um, and I think oftentimes it's the ability to believe that you can seed, succeed that takes you to a place where you have the capability to succeed. And I've always wondered, you know, players have their players groups, owners have their social groups and they're communicating. Do coaches have like a group? Do you guys get together and hang out? And I mean, what do you do if you talk? <laughs> I mean, it's really, no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, you know, you've got your group, your guys that, you know, I mean, I went to the owners meeting this year and I've been, been doing this for a while now. I'm, I'm one of the older guys now. <laughs> and uh, I, when I first started, I was the young guy that, you know, didn't know anything. I mean, couldn't find my car in the parking lot, you know, at the, at the coaches meetings and the owners meetings. But now it's like the young guys, sometimes they don't want to come up. They don't want to come up to the older guys and even say anything. It's like you kind of, man, it's like it's a <laughs> generational gap. But uh, a few, a few, you get to know guys. But, you know, guys like Andy Reid, Andy and I were together. Andy, yeah, Andy was my boss. And, you know, we're always going to be close. And Ron Rivera, you know, uh, Sean McDermott, we coach together on any staff. So those, you're always going to be close with those guys. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I love Coach Belichick. You know, I've always admired him and studied what he does. So, you know, we've still got our, our crew. <laughs> Got it. Do you ever think that'll change where coaches have more of a, uh, like I said, more of a group? Nah, I no. don't think it will. It's just too competitive. Too and, competitive. You know, you're not really going to, at this, this stage, you're not sharing ideas too much. I mean, I talked to Coach Dungey just recently, you know, and he's become a good friend. So we were talking about some culture building stuff. So, you know, people will share ideas with you, but when you're competing against one another, you know, at this level, you know, Andy or, or Bill or Sean or Ron, mm. you really, it's just, you're working, trying to make your team the best it can be. Yeah, you have a conversation maybe here and there if it kind of if your interests intersect. Just, but you're not really palling around that much. Fair enough. So uh, with that in mind, I mean, how to how do young head coaches find that mentor? Because I think mentorship is really important, mm -hmm. especially in sports. Yeah. And um, if there isn't a coach for them to look up to, what, what do they do? Well, I think they 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 have it because they they've gotten to the point they are because they've already established some relationships and some mentorships. For sure. me, I mean, I've always had Andy. You know, yeah. so I'll call Andy and ask him certain things and. You know, he's, he was a mentor when I was an assistant. Uh, but then there's other coaches who are maybe out of the profession now as I've gotten older. But, mm -hmm. yeah, the young guys, they, they've got people to call. They've got people to talk to. It's not like, but it's not like, you know, like uh, one of the, you know, Sean McVay, who went to the same college together, is going to call me up and say, hey, coach, would you mentor me? <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, we're playing you this year, you know? <laughs> so just really not going to work out that well. So it just, you find that, I think you find those mentors more in the relationships that you've had all the years and, and it really doesn't change. Yeah. Well, and you, you've got, I mean, your brother, you've got your dad, right. so you've got, you know, family, um, which actually is something that I wondered about because I, <clears throat> my, my dad actually works for me. And uh, when I founded the company, and um, I find that our business conversations tend to take precedent over personal conversations. And sometimes keeping that work-life balance can be a little difficult. Uh, how, how do you do that? Because I mean, you got to be talking about football all the time. <laughs> oh, we have a lot of fun. I mean, yeah, but we talk about our kids. I talked to my dad the other night, and he was talking about little John, who's five years old, his first, like, sort of Little League baseball game. I said, <laughs> kind of young. He goes, yeah, they're all over in the monkey bars right now, you know, <laughs> during the game. So, yeah. you, know, we, you know, you talk about the kids and and, uh, and family stuff all the time. But, you know, as far as work-life balance, you know, one thing that, that I've found, um, the balance is 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to, it's, it's what you're committed to and it's where, where your heart is at. So, you know, you've got to be committed 100% to your family mm -hmm. and you've got to be committed 100% to your work. And the time demands that that requires in certain situations or times or day or times of the day, you've got to do what you got to do. It's like, you know, some of our players are here in the off season away from their families because we're in the rehabbing or whatever, because, because that's what they need to do to be ready to play the season in order to take care of their family. Absolutely. So it kind of all ties together in life. And I think it's important to understand that. And, you know, you've got to be doing everything to the best of your ability. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that it's what you're committed to. And my dad and I, uh, we, we are committed um, to reading the Bible together, to praying and whatnot. And we actually set up a formal meeting in our calendars to happen, you know, every mm. Friday. Uh, it's every Friday mornings. In my calendar, it's called a sales meeting, but yeah. that's not really what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it does keep you 
focused on the things that matter most. And, yeah. and sometimes scheduling them like we do is important. So, that's awesome. I mean, that's an awesome habit to, yeah. to be a part of. So, uh, I mean, I know we're running a little bit out of time, um, but, and I haven't really asked any football questions <laughs> to speak. So I have to ask, how excited are you to have guys like, you know, Humphreys and Peters and J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards back to the season? Oh, very excited. I mean, it was, it was a challenge last year when those guys went out, you know, and it was, it was a kind of a, a, a series of events that was a little bit shocking, you know. And uh, there was some questions like, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. We had to kind of deal with that. And, but I thought everybody dealt with it amazingly well. But when you see those guys, Marlon's out there now. You know, yeah. uh, uh, we've got guys working their way back to the field. I saw JK's back in town. He looks great. You know, you, you, you do. You start to get hope. Yep. And you can't wait to see all the guys together again. The boys are back in town. So <laughs> we got the band back together again, I guess. But, you know, and as a coach, I've got to think about keeping them together. We've got to, we've got to on the one hand, we've got to build our football team into a into a finely tuned machine. You know, we've mm -hmm. got to be able to execute. We've got to be in great shape. We've got to be strong. We've got to be on point. And we have to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So you try to work those two things together. Uh, do you think they'll all be back and ready for training camp? Uh, no. I think certain guys will be ready for training camp and certain guys will be ready for the season. Uh, they, should all be, they should almost all be ready for the season. There's a chance a couple guys could end up PUP, could push into like midseason. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that happens, it, it's okay. It mm -hmm. happens. But uh, at some point in time before the season's over, they, they'll all be back. Yeah. Well, and I think, uh, like we said earlier, some negative things can result in positive results. And I think those those injuries resulted in some great draft picks this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I'm personally excited about the picks that we saw come through, and I'm sure you guys as well. So uh, well, one last question before we end it. Uh, you mentioned uh, Romans 8. I'm curious if you have a favorite Bible verse. Uh, my, 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 two favorite ver my two favorite verses, if you want to take them, are, 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 are John. Chapter one, chapter one through five, and Joshua chapter one, one through nine. Mm. So uh, all your listeners out there can go look those up. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. So everyone out there in YouTube world, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. And John, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Me as well. Thank you. <laughs>